First off, congratulations, everyone. Thank you. You have been enjoying, whoops, it's under the table, no biggie. Uh, well-deserved, you've been enjoying well-deserved acclaim, uh, much more to come, I'm sure, but um, congratulations on that. And I know you've been on the road with this picture, at least in the public, for almost a year now. Uh, and I know that because I was there when it all started in Sundance last January. So I want to talk to you about that journey um, and how the film has, has evolved for you in this past year, um, your experience uh, of sharing it with folks. But I thought, um, in a very selfish and personal way, I would start with something that's touched me recently um, in thinking about your incredible work um, and everything that you've pulled off together. Um, and it has really something kind of off in left field in a way, but um, Three days ago was the 30th anniversary of James Baldwin's passing. And a number of quotes of his were circulating. And one that I read um, struck me. And I'll read it to you all. Um, quote, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. Wow. And when I read that, I mean, again, this is James Baldwin, years, I mean, everything he says somehow becomes poignant again. Um, but I really thought of your work immediately. Um, so Dee, I'm just throwing that out there. If you would talk about maybe um, some of the relevances of creating a work of art that suggests to people that, yeah, we have to face pain. Well, that's like the biggest compliment we've gotten all year. If you put this film and James Baldwin yeah, in the same things, <laughs> it was oh my I'd, God, yeah. It just happened. I just thought about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that you know, I think that through these characters and in this narrative, there's this like reluctance to kind of truly like look at the self, you know, in a way. And so, you know, you could make that bigger and look at our entire country and like how have we been unexamined, you know, and kind of like our treatment of our history and how much do we invest in mythologies, you know. In school we're taught about manifest destiny, you know, and we're taught about, you know, the the the, the patriots and like this idea of freedom, but we never really interrogate like what those founders did, you know, in the name of these like ideals, you know. And so I think that like this film invites us to do that, interrogate our personal inheritance. Like how do we come by this land? How do we come by this labor? And that translates to now because, of course, we don't have the same economic growth we did because that was based on a model of free labor. So, of course, growth is, go growth is gonna necessarily slow. So, because we haven't looked at ourselves as a country, I feel like, you know, we continue to kind of have this, like, cyclical kind of bit behavior, yeah. And Baldwin had another quote where he's talking about, you know, lynching imagery, and he's talking about how, you know, the people in the photos are looking at the camera, no one's looking at the body. And so in this film, you know, it forces us, like, we have to look at the body. Like, we don't have the option of looking away, so, yeah. And anyone from the cast want to speak to that? Um, working with a director who was, you know, intentionally bringing an audience's attention to these, these you know, difficult realities of our country and, and forcing us to recognize that pain. Yeah, I think that's the point of it. Yeah. You know, I, I really do, and I think, you know, as we come in this award season and we're watching films that that are A, great films, but B, make a difference or have something to say, I think it's really important. Um, and, you know, this is a combination of everything you hope for. You know, it's a certain novel, deinterpret it. They deinterpreted every single step and moment of this and each single scene. Uh, that, so it's not just mudbound the novel at all. It's, it's mudbound the novel through Dee Rees' very deep personal history and intelligence that is, is brought up to what she wants to talk about. And you see it right up to the final frame. And that image of looking at the camera, I've never thought about that. That's just horrific. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a lot of those photos, you know, where people like yeah. posing like trophies, like everyone's looking at the camera, no one's looking at the body. And I yeah. think, you know, as a country, we like we haven't looked at the body, like the miracle body of like, you know, how we came to be here. So And just to, to go back to my first observation, again, you guys have been spending a year with this project. Anything, any reactions about with audiences that have struck you um, in what you've brought to them uh, over the course well, of this? For me, I think it's just the fact that so many people are like unaware, you know, which makes this film beautiful because we just jump from slavery to like civil rights, and we never really talk about this stretch of time that has such a hold on us as a, as a society, you know, because there's this level of like hate, 
you know, in between us. And there's this wall up and there's all these things happening and it's because we're just sweeping it under the rug. You know, we don't really want to talk about it. So it's 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 good, I think, that we did this film, but it's also going to become more of a, a tool rather than a point that's being made. And that's my honest belief. I, I'll say on top of that, I mean, <clears throat> I was, um, some of my family members had watched it in northern Minnesota. And... It was funny that my aunt was saying my cousin Tony's reaction was like, you know, during a lot of the hard scenes, he was saying, God, you know, why do they make films like this? Like, why do they do this? And, and he's sitting back <laughs> by the table and his wife and kids are running around. And I think they, you know, it's 12 of my family members in a small town watching this. But, and, you know, our, our town, like our segregation was between Swedes and Norwegians. <laughs> like, and, or if you were first Lutheran or Methodist. And so for them to be watching this and be like, man, because you don't see it, they don't see it, and I didn't see it as much growing up. Um, and, and so it was very interesting to see that reaction from it, you know, of them having to, to watch, you know, life in the South um, um, post-World War II and just everything that actually did go on. I mean, you know, we're kind of um, up there. It's, I think it's fair to say that we're kind of raised with the sort of wool over our eyes uh, to a certain extent. And one, one other like reaction that, that stands out for me was that it was like at Sundance, where it's like after the screen, like this guy had tears in his eyes, and he was like a white guy, and he was talking about how you know he had recently his 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 mother has had passed, and he was taking care of her affairs, and he'd come across this like cache of like tapes, you know, and so his mom on these tapes is like singing these like horrible songs, and he's like and he's like should I burn? He's like I'm so ashamed, like should I burn them? Like no, like you should keep them. Like the whole point is to like investigate them. Like this is evidence, and Baldwin talks about evidence. Evidence, you know, and so I think if that guy can look at his mother in a complicated way, you know, then he might be that much more, you know, uh, mindful, you know, in the way he's talking to his children, you know. So it's like, don't don't burn the evidence, yeah. you know, like don't, you know, like shame is useless. Like, how do you take that feeling and, and make it into something that's like actionable? So yeah, reconciliation, something this country really has not had, um, and you know, never too late in a way, and and um, this film certainly has started a conversation. Um, Ms. Blige, I wanted to speak to you a little bit about the character, first of all, and admission. So I went to see this film, and I try not to read too much about anything that I see. I mean, I, I known Dee's work because at, uh, at MoMA we had shown her first film in New Directors New Film, so I was, I was really anticipating that, and I knew, I knew you were in the film. When the credits rolled, and I, I was like, well, I know Mary J. Blige was in this film, but like, would she have a cameo? Like, I, did I miss it? I swear to God, I was on the floor. I was like, no, no. You, anyway, so, I mean, just bow down. You disappeared into this role and emerged on the other side. This incredible, Thank you. incredible. But you emerged as the center of the film, in, in a way. Like, her centeredness is what lifted up and held up these people, right? And um, I just, you know, especially the fact that there's all these men, in particular, that just want to burn everything down, right? And she's not gonna let that happen. Um, and in a way, she's a symbol for many women, I think, um, right. historically, who have, held things up when men around them are, are burning things down. Maybe just talk a little bit about developing Florence. And well, I, I think women are the center, period. We, we always hold things together. And um, we, we suffer quietly. And you know, we suffer quietly because we have to, and, but we're powerful people. And um, when I was a little girl, like seven years old to like age 13, my mom would send us to Georgia because both my parents are Southern. And my grandmother was this woman, Florence. So I knew she, this woman is in my DNA. So I, knew, I know how to suffer silent. I know how to really be, suffer quietly and but be powerful at the same time. So she was already in me. And then Dee just said, you know, get rid of Mary J. Blige, period. And <laughs> it was hard to pull away from her because, you know, she's been around. <laughs> 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 but Dee was like, she, she kept her foot down and she, she said, Florence doesn't need, you know, to have anything to be beautiful. But, you know, she really put into perspective the things that I was holding on to, that, you know, that deemed me beautiful, you know, like lashes and stupid stuff like that. 
But, you know, Florence really liberated me once she was born. She really, like, helped, gave me a whole bunch of new confidence that I've had. But thanks to Dee and her direction and, and just keeping her foot on my neck, because Florence would have had a wavy wig. <laughs> She'd have some lashes. I mean, I'd have got rid of the nails, but I was trying to make her a cute, you know, kind of farmer wife, like... <laughs> But you like, no, your own edges, your own. That's, so, yeah. That's Mudbound too. Mudbound in the city. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you can have that, actually. If you, uh, terrible. I'm sorry. Um, so my next question is actually for um, Jason M. and, and Garrett. Um, you know, I was thinking about, you know, the construct of race um, as, as opposed to ethnicity. I mean, race was invented to separate people, right, and to divide people. Um, and in a way, I, when I think about your characters, I, I think it, for me, it crystallizes, right? Like, right. here are two guys who have so much in common, right. and yet they are divided by this construct of race. So in a way, you know, I tried fl even in my head flipping the characters, like, and imagining either of you playing the other character, and I could totally see it in a way. But maybe just talk about that, you know, that play back and forth, that that amazing um, tandem kind of act that you guys have. Um, it definitely was all Dee's work because, like, what you see on screen is truly what you see, like, in the real world. The way that we, like. She used the blocking to separate everything. You know, when I first reached my hand out, he's like, no, I don't want to touch you. We touch through the hat, and we get in the truck, and I don't want to get in the front of the truck. And then he makes me get in the front of the truck, and we don't look at each other. And then we, you know, finally kind of start looking at each other. And then when we talk in the barn, we're slowly getting closer. And then when we finally get close enough, it breaks. And that's sort of, I think, how race is today, really. Or just in general, you know what I mean? It's, it's this thing that we're so afraid to get close and we're so afraid to tell the truth. And when we finally do, it's judged, you know? And um, I think that's what makes it beautiful because it's not all cheesy, but we're definitely bound together by, like, what we've been through, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, we went to war together <laughs> and we went and represented our country together and it, it, it brings up something different, you know what I mean? Like, when you're in a foxhole with somebody, and people around you are losing their lives. It's like, I don't think any of us in this room can really imagine how that is, you know? So to go through all that and people still want you to be a part is like incredible. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's something that doesn't even really make sense. And, you know, if you put a white baby and a black baby in a room together, they're not going to know the difference. You, you know what I mean? They can acknowledge that they might be different colors, but they're not going to see each other as different people. And I think that's what really makes this relationship so beautiful, the fact that they just see each other and they have a chance to see each other. And I don't know, it's it's the world around them that's just so, so crazy, you know? So hopefully, like, this can show people, you know? Because our military, like, skateboarders have a beautiful thing because if you can kick flip a skateboard, everybody knows how, how much you've been through, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter if you're white, yellow, purple, you know what I mean? They like, they've all been through that. Everybody's broken an arm or a wrist or an ankle or something, you know? And it was the same thing with war. And it like sort of brought us together as a band of brothers. So it was, it was, it was good. And I hope people can see that for what it is. And using our military as a backdrop is just, it's all D. <laughs> it's all D, it's great. I think, um, I think it was interesting because, you, you know, Jamie in this situation, you know, he never agreed with what was going on. Obviously, you know, he took off, and and first off, that starts with he never agreed to sort of want the farm in life. He had bigger aspirations to, you know, go see the world, and was enthralled by theater and literature, and 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 you know, sort of wanted to go out and make some uh, something of himself, and kind of fancied himself always moving to Los Angeles and, and with dreams of becoming sort of the next Errol Flynn and thought he kind of had the charm and charisma to do that. Um, and I think within that kind of branching out and, and sort of exploring the world, uh, world a little bit more, especially post-war and the trauma that he had to experience with everybody in his plane going down and, and what he had to see and, and endure, you know, that was uh, eye-opening, especially because the one that 
happened to save him was a black man. And so that's also eye-opening. Now, then going back to that he really didn't agree with it in the first place, it's, you know, it, that, that was a heritage installation. You know, it, it's what our, our great-grandparents tell us or our grandparents tell us or our fathers and our parents tell us what to believe, and it happens to all of us. And so with that being bestowed upon him, those beliefs, and in the area of the Mississippi or the Delta in which they were, obviously that's, you know, he has no other choice. And so when he comes back from war with the new acceptance, plus kind of having this thing of, you know, he survives, so he's got the survivor's guilt, the PTSD, and it's kind of when you face death so close in front of you, you kind of come back in a, in a sort of mental state of don't give a shit, mm -hmm. or like, or, you know, I've been so close to this, you know, if I go a little bit further, will that finally, will that finally give my body peace from what I've had to see all the close ones close to me go through? And so there's a fearlessness coming back and also the pain and brutality that you've endured now has led you on to sort of escapism in some form of way. He's come home to a home that he didn't care to come back to necessarily. It was never necessarily his home. So he's dealing with sort of this internal duress that's kind of bringing them down and and you know I always think within the similarities when um, Mary's character says um, can't sit still um, I, um, won't eat won't sleep can't sit still can't you know can't move and and I thought that that's something that tied these characters together very much and them seeking each other through this brotherhood was was what both of them really needed to come home and that's why people coming home today with PTSD they have places to go to talk to people and counselors and everything that went through what they did saw what they saw and and can help each other and I think that was you know a sort of 40s version of one of these <laughs> councils that they got right. to heal each other with right because I guarantee you None of those are like race-driven classes at all. They don't have an all-white PTSD class that you can go to, I'm sure. I think like the, the, uh, that, the, that the brokenness is like an interesting theme, and I was interested to explain this idea of porousness. So not only are the environments porous, where the women are trying to keep the outside out and the inside in, but also like their kind of minds are porous, and it's because they're broken that they're more porous, I think, than the other characters. And these ideas kind of move between them. And Florence comes, like Florence and Laura get this porousness, but it's born from trauma, you know, in a way. And it's so, that yeah. pain that we were talking about. You know, people don't want to experience the pain after, you know, the, the hate goes away, then what? Then what do we say to each other? You know, it's like, do we all go home or what happens? You know, like, and and it's just, you know, a thing where we all have to continue to support each other because people are people and good decisions are good decisions and bad decisions are bad decisions. And me, that's what I took most from this movie that after all Runzel been through, he still chose love. You know what I mean? Everybody has choices. You can choose to do whatever you want to do and choose to be the type of person you are, but everything is consequential, you know? So you should just choose to do the right thing. Yeah. I think after the, um, the hate goes away, because it's something to hang on to, it's an excuse, it's, it's an obstacle, we're forced to deal with ourselves, and that's what people don't want. We don't, like, I, a lot of people don't want to deal with themselves. <laughs> a lot of people don't want to be by themselves. So that's, you know, where the problem comes in at. The world is afraid to, to look in the mirror. So I'm hoping that this film is, is making everyone look in the mirror because it's a, definitely a direct reflection of where we are right now today. So I'm hoping in a good way, because the silver lining in this film is that it's not all hatred, black people are free, there is love, <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's, it's, there's a beautiful message here that's being told that, that Dee had the courage to tell. And um, I'm grateful to be a part of just something so powerful, something so important that everybody's talking about. Um, I will open it up to the audience for questions, so get them ready. But I have one more. Um, D, I'll start with you. And actually, um, but looking across at Jason Clark, it makes me think I'm right. Uh, but I was thinking, I mean, you've created an epic work of cinema. And, you know, I'm thinking about um, references that you may have had. I mean, everybody places different references on, on works of cinema throughout his. I w I'm interested to know if you had any going in, but I thought a lot about the work of John Ford. In, in relation to this picture. And, you know, I'm looking at Mr. Clark over there. I'm thinking of, he's your Henry, you know, um, your Henry Fonda, and this is, <laughs> but uh, 
was he an influence or who may have been in terms of creating this kind of epic scaled work? Well, just in terms of the approach to the story, you know, I really wanted to approach it like a Western, like a pioneer story. So it's not just, you know, it's not part of the scope is the relationships. It's not just like the plot of what's happening. And in terms of references, I think most of them came from like the visual arts world. Like there's a contemporary artist named uh, Whitfield Lavelle who does portraits on wood. And so like that was a lot of inspiration of like the, of, like, the palette and the tone on tone of the Jackson family. Or um, a sculptor named Mary Frank who does like these kind of like site sculptures where there's bodies emerging from the ground. And um, there's a documentarian named Les Blank. And so uh, he did a thing called The Truth According to, Light to Lightning Hopkins. So like I liked that and it's like, okay, if the film can feel like that, you know, taking, like watching a figure walk from like background to foreground and just waiting for it, you know, then I'd be happy. So yeah, like Rachel Morrison was the DP and she was amazing and amazing. And, and, and her references were like Dorothea Lange and like all those old kind of WPA like fo photos. So like we didn't watch other movies to make this movie, like that was the thing, but we did want it to be that kind of old fashioned seven reeler, eight reeler where, you know, you feel something in the end because of the cumulative effect of having invested in these characters over time, you know, so yeah. <laughs> Jason Clark says yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, questions in the audience? Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, and there's a mic coming to you if you hold just a second. Hi, um, I'm, I'm, I work with the national office of a group called Refuse Fascism, and I want to comment. You started out tonight by talking about all the films that are so powerful right now that are moving audiences. Like I just saw. Um, 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 call me by your name, and and we have a we have a president who jokes that the vice president talks about hanging gay people. We have a situation where um, Handmaid's Tale. All these films were made started made before the election. Handmaid's Tale, which I'm sorry, it is an instructional manual for the current president right now. And then you have the situation with black people which is, as you said, it's woven into the fabric of this country from its birth. It's in its DNA. And now it's taking this form of the most horrific. I mean, you made this, and then Charlottesville happened. And I, you know, one of the things is, I think what you were saying about the power of film right now, we got to win. We have to fight this and win. We can't just keep commenting on it and just, you know. It's, but what you're doing here with the film is so important. And I was hoping you could speak to this thing around what are we going to do? I mean, you are filmmakers who are speaking to the moment. And I so, think we've got to do something now. So maybe I'll give you guys a little context of how I introduced the film. Um, and I may well speak to her comment. Um, I was saying, you know, despite the fact that everybody's talking about what a, an intense and intensely um, difficult moment the film industry is going through, it, it, it is also a necessary moment. But it, all of that kind of um, ignores the fact that there's an enormous amount of creativity and um, um, empowerment and um, motivation and inspiration happening in the actual art itself. Um, and I was saying that Dee, we so, I was so honored that Dee and all of you could be here tonight because I think this film is emblematic of that moment and, and certainly you are, Dee, as, a, as an artist. So that, that is kind of the reference point of well, I mean, if you, I mean, if you think this is timely, if you go to Octavia Butler in Power Below the Sower, she talks about a candidate named Jared, whose slogan is "Make America Great Again." <laughs> Octavia Butler like wrote this like decades ago, you know. So it's kind of like she saw all this coming. So I feel, I feel like in that same way that that literature now can like you know make me feel like okay, like maybe there's a plan, like maybe there's a way out of this. Like I think that like I think that imagination is is like a big part of it because I think racism. Racism at its most benign is a failure of imagination, you know, at, like at its most benign, you know, and so I feel like in that way culture is important because it allows you to, to then start to think of solutions or think of ways around it or like out of it, you know. So I think that, you know, it, in this film particularly, you know, instead of just it being like a strict villain, I'm exploring whiteness as currency. So then maybe that's the way we can start to figure our way out of this, you know. It's not that, you know, um, Pappy is is necessarily worse than Henry. He's just participating in a different way. Like he's flaunting it, whereas Henry is still participating in an economic system that's based on oppression. You know, so he's not calling a name, but is you know he's ha asking Hap to get up on a broken leg. And then the same way, Laura is like bartering with her. It's like it's not that she loves Florence or wants her in her house. She's trying to get her kids taken care of. So it's a transactional thing. So, but she's still participating in the system in a transactional way. And then Jamie tries to pretend he doesn't have it. He's like, oh, I don't see color. You know, he's he's trying to burn his current 
currency, but that's equally problematic because it endangers Ronzel. So I think that culture helps in terms of like putting forward ideas. So it's like the long game. I think we need activism. I think you need the people in the streets. I think you need um, scholarship. You need the people writing the essays. And I think you need the artists, the people like, like you know, challenging our imaginations to grow because I think that's the way you kind of like start to come up with solutions, so. Yeah, yeah I mean, <sighs> Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you could clap that up. Yeah, so, yeah, that was that was hard. I mean, we all got to be honest, guys. Donald Trump is our first orange president, which also makes him a man of color. So, I mean, he should all he should bring us all together anyway. You know what I mean? And I, I think what's happening right now, and <laughs> yeah, I think what's happening right now is is just a reflection of us. You know what I mean? Like not being responsible or whatever it may be. You know, because like. I'm I'm black, so of course I'm gonna get on black people. You know what I mean? Like, don't complain about the president if you don't vote, or don't complain about these things if you don't want to participate to make it better. And I think just as a whole, we have to work together to make it better. And that's really what it is. That's what you're saying. You know, we have to fight and we have to win. It's not a joke. You know what I mean? Like, I have kids in this world, so we gotta fight. We gotta win. Period. You know, it's it's not a thing of us being able to be like, oh no, we'll figure it out eventually. You know, film, like, film, no. But film <laughs> could, can and should contribute to that. Right. I mean, it's, it is so lazy and bloated. And on, on, on a, on a ca- we can all blame corporations or we can blame audiences who want to see it. But I think there is a market for film like this. I think people want to see it. I think uh, actors, instead of committing to... I mean, I can, I'm an actor, so I can speak to... Actors, instead of committing to making their how many millions of dollars a year doing a super you know, hero movie, they can, instead of their, their small movie being, I need an Oscar performance role, they can commit to a film which is about something. You know, which actually has a point, and which yeah. you know, and it's but it is true. It's personal responsibility, and I think it's really important as we come down to this part of the year. You know, we're celebrating great filmmaking, but we're, great films, timely films, is super important, and it's very rare that film gets to ahead of the game or or involved in the game that journalists and other art forms and other are, are doing. And I think this is one of them, and that's why I that that's truly why I think this film will last. I thought, you know, a lot of people have different things. I thought Zero Dark Thirty with Catherine was the same thing. It was ahead of the ball game with, in terms of what journalists were doing. And that has to be recognised and rewarded. Yeah. Um, and then actors and people have to make their own personal choices because it's not a given that the good guy will win anymore right. on any level. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So um, I actually think that that's um, a pretty good place to, to wrap especially because you guys have been working really hard. But I did want to make one point, and this is good for everybody in the audience to help in this, actually, and take the fight out, is it's, you know, um, it's an important thing that this film is available on Netflix. Yeah. It means that millions of people have access to it. And I think that that is an important thing in this moment that people can immediately have access to a film like this. At the um, same time, too. At the same time. I mean, and really, I mean, all be a part of the conversation. So, tell all your friends it's available right now, <laughs> and and t- and tell them about this experience and this amazing cast and this incredible director, Mudbound, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.